Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Property Buyer and Sellers Podcast. And it is the 16th of August 2024, Friday. Hope you're having a good day if you're just tuning in. And uh, we're talking about a number of things today. We've got renter's rights for you, capital gains, tax and labour. A uh, little chat about that. Let's with pets. We've had a question on that, which we're going to bring to you. Landlord licensing in Merton and Lambeth. Uh, a market update and then tenants requiring eviction. They're the subjects that I want to cover for you today. So um, first of all, something that I keep seeing in the uh, press and all the headlines, all the rhetoric about you know, all the Labour politicians saying the one thing we're going to stop is all these bidding wars. It's terrible. We're going to attack these landlords that are causing these bidding wars. Uh, let me tell you something about bidding wars and rentals. Bidding wars, really, you know, to think that they are the problem is just ridiculous. They are the symptom of the situation when you constantly push landlords out of the frame and do things to deliberately deter landlords, such as the Section 24 uh, bill, uh, not allowing landlords to deduct interest against their gains. And what this means is there's less and less property. And of course, if there's less and less property, then what happens is there's competition for the remaining property because we're still finding we've got just as much, if not more, demand for property to rent. And of course, rents are high already. And the idea that Labour have come up with is the brilliant solution to all this is to stop bidding wars. Well, great, but that really doesn't tackle the problem because the big problem is supply. And in order to get more supply, you need to get more landlords to invest in property, not less, more. And the way you do that is by giving them encouragement that this is something that they should be doing and that they're needed and they're not the devil incarnate. And many of the measures that come today, it seems to me, seem to come from government where they're saying, you know, the problem with the housing market is dot, 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 landlords. It's always landlords, isn't it? It's, you know, you've got these landlords that are doing all these bad things. And the reality is, as I've said many times, most landlords are decent people that have made an investment choice for their families. And they've done it maybe because they want to pay their children school fees later on through the investment, maybe because they want to supplement to their pension, something that's reliable, bricks and mortar. Yes, it's all very well having stock market investments, and that's great, but they fluctuate greatly. Bricks and mortar always tends to be there regardless of the situation. But there are certain difficulties as we're going to come on to. Um, so a few things we've had, that's bidding wars. So as far as bidding wars are concerned, yes, they happen. And they don't happen because tenants uh, particularly want to uh, compete with others in the sense of bidding over others, but they will. They won't hesitate to say, this property is better for me. And if I can give you a bit more money, uh, then um, I will. And so you do get these situations where you haven't asked for more money, but tenants will say, I know you've told me this property is gone, but we'll give you another £200 a month. Is that the landlord's fault? Uh, what's the agent supposed to do? Are we supposed to not relay that information on to the landlord? It's a really difficult situation. Uh, what we tend to do is try and set the rents at a price that is reflective of the current market anyway to try and prevent it. And I don't see this whole ending bidding wars as being a thing, really. I just don't see how they're going to do it, how they're going to enforce or police it. I really don't know. But that's on bidding wars. We'll see what Labour are going to do about that. Um, just something on the um, landlord licensing now. There are now two recent schemes. We've got one in Merton here locally uh, in the southwest of London. And Merton's been in since uh, December now last year. And the fees there are £692. And this is selective licensing. So if you do own a property, you're a landlord in the Merton borough and you don't know it yet, you will need a license in most of the wards. So make sure you check on the Merton.gov website. Your ward is probably covered. And if you haven't yet got a license, then you are uh, breaking the law effectively. And you won't be able to serve a Section 21 notice without the grant of a license. So make sure you get on that. Fees are currently £692. And while we're on that subject, Lambeth have come up with a new scheme as well. And their fees are £923 for selective licensing. Now, selective licensing is not HMO licensing. HMOs, housing multiple occupation, have always required licenses in these boroughs. This is a separate license scheme, which in my view is just a money-making tactic on behalf of the local authorities. They make it out that it's this big protection thing, but at the end of the day, it's a revenue getter, and it's a big one. Uh, I think we worked out something like £18 million is going to be uh, received by Lambeth Council on the basis of their £900 of property 
scheme. Um, and on top of that, of course, we're going to have a central register, which the government will no doubt want a fee for where you upload all of your certificates and everything else. So let me get this right. Local authorities want all this information for the safety of tenants and you're going to pay a fee for that. And then central government want the same information in the central database and you're going to pay to register there as well. Surely there has to be some joined up thinking here. And at some point, the licensing schemes locally have to go and we have one central body that we all report to. That would make much more sense. And I guess that's where it will head eventually. Um, I've had an email in from Ray as well about lets with pets. Another thing in the Renters Reform Act, which is coming, and that is that landlords won't be able to unreasonably refuse a uh, tenant with a pet. And the default position will be pets are allowed. Uh, now, there is some difficulty with this. For instance, many leases provide that you can't have a pet in a flat. And this is understandable because where does the pet exercise? And often, in my view, it's going to cause problems with things like dogs barking. It could be a nightmare for people, couldn't it? You imagine many tenants go out to work all day, leave the pet indoors, pet gets lonely, bored, hears a noise, whatever it is, barking. And then you've got other people trying to work from home with a dog barking in the building. So this could be a real issue. How do you defend against it? You know, what Ray has said, I've actually got his email on the screen here. He said, I've got nothing, uh, no problem with that in principle, allowing pets. But would we be allowed in such circumstances to take an extra non-refundable sum to cover a deep clean and fumigation when the tenant leaves? Well, the short answer, Ray, is no, you won't be able to take an extra deposit because the deposit regulations are that you can only take a maximum of five weeks rent as a deposit. Uh, the only other way of doing it is to go for something like a zero deposit scheme, which will give you up to six weeks of, of cover for the same thing. This is an insured based scheme. And uh, we can talk to you about that if you need advice on it. But the main issue here is what can you do? And the answer is you can't insist that they don't have pets unless your lease provides they can't have pets, in which case you should, because I believe that that's a reasonable defense against the legislation. Only time will tell. Um, but also that you should insist on insurance, pet insurance for the landlord. And what this means is that any damage carried out by the pet while the owner is while the leaseholder is there or the tenant rather is there can be repaired via the insurance policy. So in my view, it will be essential that any tenants with pets have insurance that protects the landlord against further damage, right? So hopefully that will cover any additional damage that is uh, created by pets. It won't solve the problems of dogs barking while tenants go out to work and everything else. And of course, there are many resp responsible pet owners and, you know, we love pets here at the Property Buyer and Sellers podcast, but also I think there's a time and a place for owning pets, particularly dogs. I think it's quite sad when you've got dogs in accommodation with no outside space. Um, cats are a little bit different, but even then, if you've got a cat in a flat, how does it get in and out? Because cats like to go out and roam. So, you know, there are lots of difficulties with it. And I do think that the default position that they should just be allowed is a strange one. But nonetheless, you can understand it. They're trying to give tenants more rights. And you can completely understand that. Now, uh, the next thing I wanted to come on to is renters rights. What do we know about renters rights so far? Um, so the uh, just going to go through what we know so far. We won't know anything more until the government reconvenes in September. It's not going to happen instantly because as much as Labour said, you know, as soon as we get in, we're going to instantly um, have this new bill, which is going to ban Section 21. Well, here we are. They're in and they haven't done it. Why? Because they have to follow the same procedure as everybody else. It doesn't mean it won't happen relatively quickly, but it does mean it couldn't happen instantly. And so some people are thinking, what have they forgotten about? It is a pledge that's gone. And it's my view that this has been a major pledge of the government and that they will see this through in Section 21 will be banned. Um, I don't think this would be good for the housing market because I think it will scare some landlords and particularly for this reason. In the banning of Section 21 in the renters uh, rights uh, bill, there was talk of reforming courts and this is critical to the confidence of landlords. There are already huge queues if you do require your property back and you have to go to court to secure it. Those queues will only get bigger when you bring in a banning of Section 21. And this is the worry is that you they're going, yes, they're going to bring in a banning of Section 21. There will be new grounds under Section 8, we believe, that will still protect landlords and allow them to gain possession for other reasons, such as a family member moving in, the landlord wishing to sell, 
Um, so there will be reasons why you can still get the property back. But the difficulty will be that it will spook many landlords. And in spooking landlords, many landlords will say, well, actually, I don't feel like I've got control or any reassurance in this government that this is the right way forward. And therefore, I feel like I'm going to sell. And I think we're going to see an exodus of even more landlords uh, quitting the sector. And this will be bad for supply, which comes back round to their whole, it seems cynical, doesn't it, when you think about it, they're going to stop these bidding wars. And on the other hand, they're attacking landlords in a way that will make landlords sell up in many cases and therefore exacerbating the situation because the stock levels will no doubt dwindle. And when the stock levels dwindle and there's still huge demand, especially here in London and most major cities, then this will cause more of a problem. But let's look at what they're saying will happen so far. So the main measures which the um, Department of Housing Communities and local government have put forward and we expect to include our scrapping section 21. This is the no fault eviction that you've heard of. They're going to not allow section 21 no fault evictions to happen. I think they will be replaced with some grounds under section eight. There'll be new grounds, as I've said, which will allow landlords to serve notice. Increasing the minimum term of occupation before landlords could serve notice, possibly up to two years. That will be a big one. Uh, maximum time for upfront rental payments. Now, you may know that because of the situation where tenants are bidding against each other, some tenants are trying to trump others by saying, OK, we'll give you the rental upfront for a period of time, maybe six months or a year in advance in some cases. And of course, this is attractive to landlords to have that whole sum up front. You know, there's no worry about whether they'll collect the rent in the first place. I would add caution there, though. If tenants are offering you money up front, landlords, please, please, please make sure you do your due diligence because often they're giving you rent up front and saying you don't need to worry about my credit because here's the money because they know you should be worrying about their credit and come six months or a year down the road, you'll find that the payments dry up possibly and then you're in a situation where you have to evict a tenant that had you done your due diligence on in the first place, you would never have taken. So don't be overly tempted by upfront rent payments. I had to tell a story about a drug den um that was a, one of my landlord's situations where they took very large upfront rent payments and ended up with huge damage to the property through the fact it was turned into a drug farm so proceed with caution when it comes to upfront rent, rent payments but anyway they're talking about the maximum time for upfront rental payments to be possibly no more than a month's rent or perhaps not much more than that up to five weeks they're talking about they're also talking about introducing the decent home standard uh, and this is something that is in the social sector and they bring it into private rental space. A compulsory register, which I've just spoken about, which landlords must join. This compulsory register will no doubt come with a fee. And this is where I think there is a crossover with the landlord schemes that local authorities are um, putting into place at the moment across the UK. A new redress system. Now, this redress system is not there for you, landlords. Guess what? It's there for tenants. Uh, it's open to tenants, uh, possibly through the housing ombudsman, uh, which currently houses, handles um, social housing redress. And that may be broadened out to include the private rental space as well. Um, and measures to prevent rents being set above levels proposed by the landlord at rent review. Um, and this is where, because they can refer these to the first tier tribunal if they feel that those rent increases are unreasonable. Uh, landlords, you should probably be thinking about putting a clause into your contracts to protect you from this, which should provide for reasonable rent increases um, in line with inflation. It's not that most landlords, because most landlords aren't looking to milk the system or make sure that they get you know every single penny that they can out of it, but they do want to protect themselves against huge rental increases in the future uh, and therefore by putting in some provision for you know um, tying the rent increases to inflation it seems balanced and fair and this is what many landlords are now doing um, what else are we looking at well then we're talking about the default position with tenants of course i've mentioned and less strong reasons can be given for refusing consent one of those reasons in my view could be it's a dog i don't have a garden unless they've got something specifically preventing you from refusing, I think it's reasonable to say if you've got a flat and the person's got a dog, it's not an appropriate space for that dog in most cases where there's not an outdoor space. Um, what else have we got? Well, what's new? Between what we knew about the renters reform bill and what the Labour Party are likely to do. Well, I think what's new is, is two things. Number one, I think we can expect the Labour Party to want to enact this legislation 
as soon as is practically possible. They want to be able to say, there you are, we delivered on these points. And in my view, the, the Renters Reform Act in whatever form or whatever you want to call it, will be enacted as soon as they possibly can. It still has to go through the same procedures and the time frame. We'll come on to that in a minute. But in terms of new measures, so we're like looking at the bidding wars um, and we're looking at the rent increases, uh, powers given to Metro mayors to um, vary enforcement. They're talking about uh, localised reg regulations. And of course, this could be uh, something that could cause rent controls. We don't think rent controls are likely, um, but if rent controls were to come, we would see a big exodus of the private landlord. And that would certainly be a disaster for the housing market, in my view. And on that, one third of private sector landlords would sell at least some, if not all of their properties, if rent controls were introduced. Um, and this is data compiled by Pegasus. And it finds that uh, in the second quarter of, eight, uh, of the year, 82% of landlords reported strong demand from tenants. Um, but they also said that a third of private sector landlords would sell. So if rent controls were introduced. So this is huge. And the trend would be upward in terms of numbers of landlords selling. Um, when it comes to purchasing new homes to rent, 10% of landlords said that they would purchase new homes to rent out. But one third, 33% said they plan to sell over the same period. That's current. That's not to do with the legislation that's coming. So we can expect that to get much higher uh, when the rent is reform bill in whatever form it is or whatever they wish to call it comes in. Um, and what Ben Beadle says, he's the uh, chief exec of the National Residential Landlords Association, is whichever way you look at it, there are more renters looking for a place to live than there are homes available. Ultimately, rent controls would prove a disaster for tenants. We agree with that, of course. All they would do is choke off supply further, undermining what little choice tenants currently have when looking for somewhere to live. Housing is expensive because we don't have enough of every type of property, be it for owner, occupation, social or private rent. The only way to solve this crisis is to boost supply right across the board. And Labour have talked about doing this in various ways, haven't they? Uh, and uh, let's hope that their planning reforms lead to some sort of increase in house building. But personally, I feel that house building happens when property prices rise because the main driver of house building are the big 10 house builders in the UK. And they don't really care what the government says. They do care about planning, of course they do, but they'll only build houses when they can see that prices are rising in any great volume. And what happens is when we've got a market which is fairly stagnant, they tend to hold back. And when they hold back, this then really does frustrate supply. And that's what's been happening at the moment. Now we covered renters' rights and what we feel is gonna happen there. Uh, let's with pets, we covered as well. And yeah, remember, if you've got a property in Lambeth or Merton, there are licensing schemes. Look it up. Do get in touch with me, Ken at jamesalexander.com, if you need any help in that direction. Um, let's talk about the market now. A lot of people are worried about the market. They're finding I'm getting a lot of calls from, from people that are selling across the UK and asking for advice, as we always do here at the Property Buyer and Sellers podcast. And a lot of them are worried because they found that there's a big slowdown in the numbers of people that are visiting their home with a view to buying. And what I would say there is for most markets in the UK, don't worry. Now, the exception to this is the holiday destinations. And the reason for that is many people go on holiday and make a decision to buy. So July always can be very good for holiday destination purchases, but for the rest of the market, it's a very slow time. And the reason it's a slow time, particularly in August, is everybody's on holiday. And if you're in an area where you're selling mainly family homes, those families are enjoying their children, they're enjoying their holidays, they're working on their tan and having a nice relax away from work. Don't worry too much. It will pick up in September. Um, on from that, what do I think will happen with interest rates? Well, we've seen the one quarter point fall already. Uh, it's widely mooted that we may not see a fall in September because the inflation figures are a bit shaky. I don't know. It's very difficult to know. It's on a bit of a knife edge. I'm sure they won't go up. Uh, at best, they're going to go down by a quarter point, but I think it might be neutral and they might just stay put in September, which would be disappointing, but not the end of the world because we have seen that direction of travel is downwards. Hopefully those inflation figures will start to ease off before we get to that next meeting and we can still see that quarter point rate cut that we're all hoping for. My gut feeling right now, 
is that it's probably going to be a hold and we're going to see interest rates there where they are. But we have seen a lot of sub 4% mortgages come out for the first time and that's good news for the market as a whole. So in terms of the market, what we're seeing is there are less people looking. We've got the September market coming up in a couple of weeks time. When the kids go back to school, when the parents come home from the holidays, that's when they look to move. So don't worry too much if it's not off the scale, busy right now for you, it will pick up. And if it hasn't picked up by the second week in September, you need to review your agency, your marketing, your promotion, and possibly your price as well. Because your window for selling this year the best window for selling in the market is September. When everyone's back at work and they're starting to think about moving, they want to be in, in time for Christmas. But here's the thing about the September market. It's a very short market. It starts about the second week in September, in my experience, when everybody's sort of settled down, the children are back in school. Mum's on the hunt usually, sometimes dad, but mostly mum we find. don't know why that is, um, but we find mum tends to drive the search. And then from there, we tend to find that that goes on until about mid-October, just as it starts to get really cold and dark and wet, people start to give up and think, well, even if I find a house now, it's going to go over Christmas, perhaps into the new year. And most people see the end of the year as a kind of stop or start point. So therefore, they either want to be in by Christmas or they want to be in after the new year, in which case they'll hold off their marketing and go for the spring market. Now, the spring market does have its advantages because it's a longer market. It starts when the weather breaks, usually March, but who knows in the UK, and goes right the way through. You've got March, April, May, June. It's busy. July gets quieter. August is the quietest of the summer months. And then, of course, we've got the September market. October, not as strong. Half of it is OK. The second half is weaker. November, December tend to be weaker still, December being probably the weakest month of the year and the beginning of January where people are still recovering from their holidays. And then it starts to kick off again just after when the weather breaks, as I mentioned already. So in terms of the market, it's still relatively good, but it's very price sensitive. So in many cases, we're finding that houses that are on for what look like competitive prices that are perhaps just slightly over just need to be tweaked down a little bit and it can make all the difference. We're certainly finding that a lot of reviews we're doing with places we're visiting, they just need to come down a little bit and all of a sudden we're getting those inquiries coming through. Now, the next thing I wanted to come up on was tenants requiring eviction. This is something, if you're a landlord, you probably see quite regularly. We certainly do here at the Property Buyer and Sellers podcast. It's one of the most common questions is, my tenant's been advised to stay put until they're evicted because the local authorities say that they won't house them until they go through a procedure of eviction. And this is quite common with local authorities. And local authorities at one stage said that they would no longer do this, but they do. And the reason they do is they've got nowhere for people to go. So if they can delay the homelessness of anybody, they're going to do that. And it's understandable on the one hand, but it causes problems in two ways. Number one, it deters landlords from wanting to take benefits uh, receiving tenants. And that's because if a tenant is in receipt of benefits, it's highly likely that when the landlord wants the property back to sell or for their own occupation, that tenant will be advised by the local authority not to move until evicted. Now, that eviction procedure will cost thousands, normally in the region of £3,000, possibly more, if you get it right. And if you get it wrong, much more, because you'll have to reapply to the courts, everything else. And by the way, all the court fees have gone up and the queues, as I've already mentioned, are getting longer. So it can be a real frustration. My advice to you, if your tenants said this to you, is tell them to bear in mind two things. Number one, if they stop paying their rent and that's during the process of the eviction, then the local authority will use another excuse with them. And that excuse will be... If you haven't paid your rent in your current tenancy, you've made yourself intentionally homeless and therefore we won't help you. That's the first thing. The second thing is when you go to court, you can ask for the judge to award costs of the eviction against the tenants. And if you do that, it's highly likely that that's unaffordable to, to the tenants and they'll end up with a county court judgment against their name. The problem this gives them is if they then approach an agent like ourselves or any other professional agent, those agents will probably want to credit score them before they allow them to take up occupation in the private rental market. If they have a county court judgment or similar, they won't allow them to rent. And that's because most of us agents are very, very cautious these days. And if we see that there's a judgment of any kind financially, that this is a problem. And that problem will be that 
you're in a situation now where the local authority, nine times out of 10, they won't help the tenants anyway. And this is what tenants need to understand. They say they'll help you. And the way they help you is putting you in temporary accommodation, which is frankly often awful. It's very rare that they find a suitable home for you because you've made, been made homeless. It can be more sensible for the landlord and the tenant to agree, perhaps an incentive. I say incentive because some people say, oh, a bribe's illegal. It's actually not. There's nothing wrong with inverted commas bribing your tenant in the sense of saying, look, you know, you want to go. I need my place back. What about we settle by me giving you a bit of money? And you can look at it this way. You could say to a tenant, look, it's going to cost me a couple of thousand to evict you. That's going to be a hassle for me. It's also going to mean that you get a county court judgment against your name. And that judgment will be for two or three thousand pounds. So I can give you you could say, for instance, to a tenant, I can give you a couple of thousand pounds to leave or we can go to court and then I will claim the cost of that court hearing against the uh, judgment and therefore you'll end up with a county court judgment. So if you think about it, the tenant is gaining perhaps £5,000 because if you've got a claim for costs of £3,000 against the tenants and you don't pay them the £2,000, they're now £5,000 down and they haven't got a, they've now got a CCJ against their name. The alternative would be that you give them a bit of cash in order that they vacate and then they've gone, they've got some cash in their pockets, go and find somewhere else. And they haven't got a county court judgment against their name. I do think that you should discuss this with your tenant if you find yourself in a situation, because it can be a win-win for both sides. And I think that's the best thing that can happen in, in that situation. Certainly, it's what we try and do for our landlords here. So that's it for this week. Hope you've enjoyed the podcast. As always, we'll be back next week with another edition. Till then, look after your family and friends. And hopefully, let's enjoy the sunshine. Ciao.